have your Bibles, please turn with me to uh, Psalm chapter 51. Psalm 51. Tonight we'll probably go uh, jump to several uh, scriptures. Psalm 51, I'm reading from verses 16 to 17. Psalm 51, 16 to 17. You do not want a sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humble spirit or humbled heart, God. Let's pray. Father, we come once again before you. We sit, Lord, at the feet of Jesus to receive the word from him. Father, instead of coming to your presence and asking you for things, we come before you, Lord, and allow your word to transform us, to wash us. Renew us, O God. Minister your word and your spirit to us. For we are hungry and thirsty for you. We commit this time, Lord, to you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Before I start, I, allow me to read a prayer uh, from a, uh, an old Puritan prayer and devotion book. Okay. Uh, it is the Valley of Vision. Lord, high and holy, meek and lowly, thou hast brought me to the Valley of Vision, where I live in the depths, but see thee in the heights. Hemmed in by mountains of sin, I behold your glory. Let me learn by paradox that the way down is the way up, that to be low is to be high, that the broken heart is the healed heart, that the contrite spirit is the rejoicing spirit, that the repenting soul is the victorious soul, that to have nothing is to possess all, that to bear the cross is to wear the crown, that to give is to receive that the valley is the place of vision. Lord, in the daytime, stars can be seen from deepest wells. And the deeper the wells, the brighter the stars shine. Let me find thy light in my darkness, thy life in my death, thy joy in my sorrow, thy grace in my sin thy riches in my poverty, thy glory in my valley. It's a beautiful prayer that I cannot forget because even in the valley, God is there. Even in the valley, God continues to reveal himself and is willing, is there, accompanying us, encouraging us, blessing us. Believers today are very picky about the churches they want to attend, the sermons they want to hear, the pastors they are willing to submit under, and the community they want to be a part of. However, it is the criteria they chose and the standard they adopt in the selection process that is troubling. That is the problem, especially in this age where you can Google and choose your favorite pastor based on the topics. I like this pastor. His sermon is short. I like this pastor. He is very funny. I like this pastor because he talks about my favorite topic. And so they become to pick and choose. The, the Bible says what? In the last days, Paul warned that people with itching ears, they will choose who they want. It's this buffet that I have the right, I will choose whatever I want. Oh, I don't like your message. It, 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 it offends me. In fact, this morning we were talking about hearing and listening. Many people miss the word, of, the voice of God when God is speaking to them through the preaching, through the pastor, through the passage. They did not recognize it was the voice of God. So what happened? They got offended. They reacted. They walked out. They left the church. That pastor, I don't like. He, he embarrassed me. Are you offended by the preaching? Is it the pastor? Is it the preacher? 
or is it the conviction of the Holy Spirit? Many times we fail to look beyond the channel and miss God. Same thing in the selection process. We get to choose what we want based on what we want, based on, uh, based on, oh, I like that church, I'll attend, I'll, 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 I'll join this church. Why? Their sermon is short. The whole service is under one hour. Oh, I like their music. You know, the music is awesome. I like they have air conditioning. As you have seen in the video, in Nepal, you sit on the floor. Some of those houses, holes, were made of dry cow dung, pressed, because there's no cement, no concrete. And it didn't bother them. They were having a good time, and God wasn't bothered by that. The presence of God manifested. The presence of God came down to those lowly and humble places. And yet, today, with the consumer mindset, people started choosing what they want. Today, if you visit a Christian bookstore or even a, a, a website, you will find an array of books and products offering to help you to be successful in almost all the dimension and season of life. Marriage, health, even diet, finances, self-esteem, healing, external healing, inner healing, prosperity, promotion, um, uh, church growth, hey, how to raise good children, marital bliss, deliverance, effectiveness in the ministry, how to study the Bible and history. Yet, very, very few authors, and you can find, hardly find any book on the subject of brokenness. Can you say brokenness? Brokenness. And even fewer readers are interested to read books on brokenness. They want success and victory, not brokenness. If ever they want to be mended from a broken life or relationship, but not to live life as a broken vessel. Tonight we want to talk about the broken spirit which is really, it sticks out like a sore thumb. This is seldom tackled, but this is a necessary thing. So my prayer tonight is that this entire sanctuary will become an altar when men and women, young and old, present themselves as living sacrifices to God. When we gather here together, it is not to hear the pastor or the preacher preach. It is not here to be inspired or simply to be taught. But we come here to present ourselves. Yesterday, the men's fellowship and the, and the women's fellowship came here. They, they, they do that every, uh, every year, three times a year, to present themselves in the presence of God. That is what it's all about. That every time we come to the presence of God, instead of coming with a sense, Lord, this is my list my wish list he's not santa claus although he will bless us he is willing to bless us but if we come only for what his hands can do instead of what his heart is beating we miss the point and so it's important that when we come we come with the attitude lord I come here, you just say, you know, you are all my, what my life is living for, what my heart is living for, Last, the song we sang earlier. I just come for you. You're all I want. Not, Lord, this is what I want. I'm not going back to the church. My prayers are not being answered. Is that why you come to church? Are you attending two services every Sunday just because you're out of job? And the moment you have a job, you have no time for that. The moment the Lord prospers you, well, I have to fix my house on Sunday. No, I have to try out my new bus board, boat. I have to go to the, you know, the only time I can play golf is uh, on, on, on Sunday. So God will understand because he was the one who blessed us. 
Last Friday, we were talking about priorities. That is God one of your many activities and one of your many op- occupations, preoccupations? Or is God your primary focus, your primary occupation, your dominant activity that always dominate what you, you are thinking of? If God, even our spiritual discipline, even devotion, is just one of our many activities, I'm afraid we will not be able to produce the life that we wanted. I talked about that survey last Friday, about those Christians, the reason why even those who, who, who are active in church, who, who have the discipline of maintaining, you know, even spending time with God for an hour, but spend five hours on movie marathon, on social media, on computer games, they sit in their study, open their Bibles and their computer, but in, after reading for a few minutes, they're busy playing computer games. They got bored. They got sidetracked. That's not going to produce the breakthroughs. That's go, not going to produce the, the growth, the maturity we want. So this is a sobering topic that we want to talk. And tonight, we want to talk about two spirits and two hearts. The tale of two hearts. In, second, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, now, I will just use a short verse, but provide some background. First Samuel chapter 15, early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. But he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and turned and gone on down to Gilgal. Can you believe that? That Saul would not trust, or maybe he wasn't sure, He just wanted to make sure that people will will remember him and honor him. So since he's the king, he has the uh, 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 resources and the ability to ensure that. So he did not wait. Normally, people build you a monument after your death as they reflect on your contribution and your legacy. But Saul couldn't wait for him to die. Saul decided, hey, they might have forgotten. I'm not going to leave it to chances. I'm going to set up a no ornament in my own honor. I will cut the ribbon. I will unveil my own monument. I will make sure that the, the, the monument has exact semblance of my best posture and my best look. From a young man, God chose and who was so timid and shy that he was found hiding among the luggage, it has gone into his head. He became proud. He became preoccupied with self-promotion. And he was afraid to be forgotten by, by men. So everything he does was for men, was to get the credit, was for to get attention instead of what really matters. And, and today really, you will be amazed how believers, how ministers would promote themselves. I mean, it's embarrassing how they promote themselves, how they peddle their own books and own merch. Can you imagine Jesus walking around and, and, and his 12 disciples were, hey, buy our shirts. It has the signature of the Lord or the scar print of the Lord. Hey, this is, uh, this is uh, the residue of the saliva when he spat on the mat and, and made and healed. And, you know, his DNA is there. Hey, you want to buy a bottle of holy water from the Jordan River? We, we, so, and, and, and in fact, you will also see today, many big name preachers started selling their own Bibles. Their own Bibles. It's Bible, but then they have a foreword. They have some, some commentaries. And you buy them. Why? Because it's uh, Mr. So-and-so, Reverend So-and-so, Dr. So-and-so, study Bible. That doesn't make it more holy. It's just marketing. Not based on the power of the author, who is his God, the Holy Spirit, but rather endorsing it 
selling it based on the name, the reputation, the charm of whoever, whatever name they place on it. And it is sad. Churches, major churches, mega churches today, they want to write their own songs and sing their own songs. And of course, if you are not part of their fellowship or movement, you sing their song, you're going to pay for copyright. You're going to pay for the royalty. It's amazing, you know, and sometimes there are songs that you use Bible verses. Who do you pay the royalty to? You use it for free. And you want to church, you said, Lord, give me the song, download the melody, use me to write. And then you start charging. This is the generation we live in. Who are in Christianity now is, has been turned into a marketing tool. Thank you very much. And people... Unfortunately, don't, any, don't even see anything wrong with that. We want our songs to sell. So in our organization, we write our own song and sing our own song to say that, hey, we are, we are gifted. We, we, say, we, we want a lot of people to sing our, own, uh, our songs. And yet we are offended if non-members, if outsiders, if people not affiliated with us start singing, and did not pay us. What is it? What is it? It's all about me. It's all about us. It's about my name, my reputation, my, my influence, my, my credit, my, 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 you know, everything about me. And it's very tragic that it happens. There is no difference between what many are doing today to what Saul was doing, building a monument <coughs> in his own honor. I, I'm really thankful, uh, uh, Pastor Jose and I, we had the privilege to, to, to know and work with the late T.L. Osborne, the great apostle. T.L. Osborne, when he wrote, you know, he, he wrote several classic books, uh, Saul Winning, uh, Join this chariot, healing the sick, which is a classic. And when uh, when we were back in the Philippines, I'm still living there. Uh, when we were in the Philippines, he visited us in the Philippines, and uh, we wanted. But you know, books printed here are so expensive, and and a lot of people wanted to buy. And his book, especially healing the sick, was so thick, so they would you know the cost would be high. It was expensive. No, no, just print it locally. <coughs> so comes a legal question. Um, Sir, how, how many percent the royalty will you charge? He said, no, no, I will not charge you anything. These are revelation from the Lord. You go print it, sell it, and make, and, 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 and make money for your ministry. Fund your ministry and be blessed. He did not even ask for a token royalty or a token donation. He gave it all free. How many people would do that? How many people would do that today? That's money-making opportunity. My, my song became platinum. I'm going to cash in on that. My book hit the best-selling, you know, the number one chart for five months. I'm going to capitalize on that. But this humble man said, no, go and be blessed. Go and be rich. Go and be prosperous. And go and fund your ministry. Whatever money you can raise by selling those books and try to sell it as cheap as possible so more people can be blessed by the books. He was the inspiration. That's why when, I, uh, when my books uh, were printed and, and, and translated to Nepali, I, I financed the printing and the translation cost and I told uh, my friend there, give it away. Whoever needs it, whoever need, uh, wants it, give it away. Do not sell it. Why? The Lord has blessed us. The Lord has blessed us. And there's no problem if you want to sell to cover the cost. I have no problem with that. 
In fact, even if you make profit in order to plow back to the ministry, I have no problem with that. But if that is the primary reason why you keep churning out books, there is a problem. Not because you feel you, you, are, you, you, you are oozing with revelation that you want to write and share with people, but rather, you know, we've got we to gotta sell four books this year. I, I, honestly, I drive my publishers crazy. They've been saying you should at least, so that they will not be forgotten, you should at least uh, uh, release one book a year. One book a year. And then I was uh, about to release the devotional, which is really not, you know, there's a, this is a misnomer. People thought, you know, devotional. So uh, did you have your daily devotion? Yes, I read one page from, uh, from our daily bread or something, and that is devotion. No, that is not devotion. You just read the devotion of the author of that article. Devotion is more than just reading one, 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 one book and one passage and click. Do you have time for reflection, for meditation, for prayer, for application? Devotion is just, just going through that this and then, okay, I'm done. Five minutes, I'm ready, let's move on. It's not that. And so, I remember uh, the publisher telling me, said, um, nowadays people don't read. They don't like to read. So if you sell the 365 days devotional journal, it will not sell. Because they, they, they just look, 365 days so thick, never mind. They will, it, it won't fly. I suggest you do what a lot of authors are doing. You make it quarterly. You end up set, having four books of one book. You, 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 you divide it into four quarters and sell it that way it's more profitable so what happened it's been a few years now the manuscript is still with me why i'm not willing to do that just because that is the craving and the so-called demand of the market uh, uh, why do why should i play that game i was grieved by that and i said okay never mind Maybe one day I can self-publish. Maybe one day I can come up with other ways to, 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 to sell it. I'm not all about that. And the publisher will say, oh, you have royalty. I don't even, I, I rarely respond. Why? I'm not in that business. I'm not writing books just for that. I just want more people to be. In fact, uh, my children were kidding me. Oh, your book is on the market. In fact, one of my books is on, on uh, what do you call that, Amazon or something, uh, a Kindle. Or, and, and he said, but you know that? You're giving away more books than selling. I said, because I'm not a book seller. I'm not a book vendor. And can you imagine if all the Christian authors today would do that? So many people would be blessed. The people who really needed the book, the revelation, and the teaching in the book are mostly the people who could not afford to buy. And so why not make it available to as many people as possible? Saul was preoccupied with self-promotion. I have seen, you know, I, you probably see on social media, come to my meeting. If you need help, attend. I'm going to be in this city. Come to my meeting. I mean, it's, sometimes I read that, I'm embarrassed. I said, I'm promoting. I am the answer to your struggle. Recently, I saw that. Uh, and and I, I, I know the person, so I know. I feel the embarrassment. Second Samuel chapter 24, 20 to 25. When Arauna looked and saw the king, referring to David, and his officials coming toward him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Arona said, Why has the Lord the king come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David answered, so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Arona said to, the, to David, Let the Lord my king take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here are oxen, for the burnt offering, and here are threshing sledges and ox yokes for the wood. Your majesty, Arauna, gives all this to the king. Arauna also said to him, 
May the Lord your God accept you. But the king replied to Arauna, No, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burn offerings that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered his prayer on behalf of the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. Today, if that would have happened to us and said, no, you know, I want to buy your, your property. I want to build an altar to the Lord. No, pastor, because you have been such a blessing to me, I give everything to you. It's free. I'll provide the burnt offering. I'll provide the hallelujah. Thank God. But David was very clear about that. He could easily afford that and he could easily have availed that to receive a gift from my citizens, my subject, is their honor because I am the king. And yet he said, no, I insist on paying you full price. Why? I am not going to offer or sacrifice burn offering that cost me nothing. Today, for quite some time now, there are churches that would, you know, on TV or something and say, uh, for a tax-free offer, you can give this and it's tax-free. If you will give in the offering because there's a, what do you call that, tax rebate, tax-free, then I question, there's nothing wrong with that and, 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 and uh, it's a facilities that they will check. But then, if that is the reason why you will give more or the, the, the motive why you give, or instead of giving to the government, I'll give it to the church. It sounds smart. But does it mean that uh, so you won't feel the burden on your pocket? Think about it. It's legal. It's perfectly legal. But does it cost us anything? Why would they even say that? Because they're hoping that if you don't plan to give or you plan to give a smaller amount, hopefully this will be an incentive for you to give or for you to give more. The heart is what matters. It's all about it. So here we have two kings. One was preoccupied building a monument for himself. And the other wanted to build an altar to the Lord of Lords and to the King of Kings. Which one are we? Which one are we? To build a name for ourselves? Or to this, let God decide? One thing I, I, I am really privileged is because uh, of your pastor. And I'm not saying this because I'm invited here. Uh, He shunned all these things. We would go to ministers' conference and he would purposely leave his business cards in the car because he's not thrilled about exchanging cards, taking pictures and said, you know, I met these, these, these big names. He was not interested in that. He, he doesn't care if you give him the credit, if you hang his picture. He, in fact, he doesn't appreciate that. Today, there are actually, I, I, uh, there was one time uh, a, a, a major organization was, uh, 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 event was being organized. And uh, some of the Christian speakers were haggling. No, 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 my name should be first. No, let's do it alphabetical. Yes, you say that because your name started with A. Okay, let's go by H. And they, you know, they start haggling over that. And there was this big church also say, we are going to give one million. But my condition is we will be the one to decide how it's spent. We will support this event. We will give one million if we sit and we head the committee. And this is supposed to be a body activity. And when their demand was not met, they pulled out their support 
And of course, the one million never realized because why? They did not get what they want. Is that the condition of our heart? Well, you may be serving God or think you're serving God because you're doing the right thing. But what about your heart and motivation? Is your worship God honoring? Do you put other people first or you fight to have the, the billing, the, your name being first mentioned? Are you willing to be sacrificial? Do things that cost you. Is it all about our face? Looking good? Or is it about our heart that other people cannot see except God? These are questions we need to address and be able to answer. It's very important. Otherwise, we are just as religious as other people. 1 Samuel 15, 13 to 30. When Saul reached him, when Samuel reached Saul, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have lived out, I have carried out the Lord's instruction. But Samuel said, what then is the bleating of sheep in my ears? What is the lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the, from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy these wicked people, the Amalekites, which war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agak, their king. The, the soldiers took sheep. You know, if the Lord asks you to kill the, uh, wipe out the Amalekites, is the king less of an Amalekite? The king is Amalekite of the Amalekites. So they were, he was rationalizing stretching the soldier took sheep and cattle from the plunder the best of what was devoted to god in order to sacrifice them to the lord your god at gilgal now he's distancing himself when he found out that samuel didn't buy his story he was this something actually I, I i did everything but 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 the soldiers was the one who who came up with the idea of sparing the best and to offer to, to your God, no longer my God or our God, to your God, to the Lord your God. Then Saul said to Samuel, uh, um, uh, no, he said, Saul said that, does the Lord, Samuel said, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. After trying to wiggle out, trying to rationalize, trying to explain away, trying to blame others. And when Samuel did not buy any of that, he had no choice but to give a token apology. I have seen. I violated the Lord's command in your instruction. I was afraid of the people, so I gave in to them. He was more afraid of the people than the desire to honor his God. And in a way, he was blaming, it's them, it's them. I would have followed you, but it's them. They were pressuring me. He was passing the back. His apology, his confession was without repentance. His confession was forced 
and, and shallow. It was superficial, just, you know, just, just a token. Then he said in verse 25, Now I beg you, forgive my sins and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe and it tore. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human that he should change his mind. Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people, before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. He wanted to worship God, but his primary purpose is I want to still look good. I have sinned, I repent, but don't let other people know. Just keep it among ourselves. I already apologize to you. Now let's pretend as if I've done nothing wrong. Honor me as the king. Face was more important than heart. Face was more important than heart. Today, we also hear of people who may have fallen out of grace. Ministers, authors, songwriters, who made a name for themselves. And then fell into sin. It's tragic. But then, a group of people were willing, some Christian elders, statesmen, were willing to restore them to, back to spiritual health. <coughs> but they think that was below him. So they rejected that, that. I'm making more money. I'm more famous than you guys. Why should I submit to the restoration process? So they rejected that. And they turned their back. A lot of a lot of those scandals happened. Few submitted, humbled themselves, submitted to the restoration process, and the Lord restored them. Others, they just rebel. Why? They flex their muscles. They flex their finances. I'm the one sending money to your organization, and you want me to submit to you for restoration? No way. No way. I cannot accept that. What happened here? What happened here? Pride. They crave the praises of men. Exaggeration is actually a proud and unbroken word of lying, driven to make a good impression on others. Because he exaggerated, I've killed everything, I've done, I fulfilled the command. He said, What about the sound of cattle that you were told to wipe out? What about the king that I said the entire tribe should be wiped out? So they redefined, they reconfigured, they rationalized the command. Last Friday, we talked we talk a little bit about standard. The people tried to change and adjust the standard to fit their whims. This is it. Trying to... to, 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 to change God's standard and God's command to fit what they want. Pride causes us to resist or delay our obedience. The humble, broken heart says simply, yes, Lord, have your way. Lord, you are the potter, I am the clay. But no, pride would blame other people. They caused me that they pressured me. I was afraid of them. Fear of man. And look good no matter what. Let's compare again with the other hearts. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 11 to 13. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, this was after he committed adultery and orchestrated the, 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 the death of uh, uh, the husband Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. He said, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. 
you're going to, uh, to die. Notice something. He did not put up our un- argument. When, when Nathan said, that's you I'm talking about, immediately he said, I'm, I've seen, I'm sorry. No excuses, no explanation, no blaming. Just said, I'm sorry I've seen. Quick to repent. A broken vessel is not a perfect vessel. But a broken vessel is a vessel God can use. It is the only vessel God can use. But what about the crux? The crux is where the glory inside can shine through. When God will shine through and people will look at his life, he's imperfect. But I've seen the grace of God upon him. We all wanted to hide our crux. Don't hide the crux. Display the grace of God in our lives. See that, Lord, you can use me. I talk a lot about the crux in my life, about my, my weird childhood being bought from an abortion clinic for $60. Uh, and sometimes my children are embarrassed and sometimes they're bored and said, here we go again. Uh, uh, we're sick and tired of this story. I said, this is who I am. I am proud of my background. Such a bad background. But God can still use. Why? This is not about self-promotion. This is about glorifying God. So do not allow the enemy to deceive you and say, hey, hey, remember you've just seen. How can God use you? Yes, God can use you. God can still use you. In fact, God wants to use you. Cracked vessels, broken vessels are the only one God can use. If you're too perfect, it's never about the God using you, the God in you. It's all about your flawlessness. Second Samuel 24, 10 to 14, and then 17. David was conscience stricken. This was when he was, uh, uh, sinned against God by, by, by counting the soldiers. And uh, there was consequences. And when he was rebuked, uh, David was, uh, was uh, so convicted. He, he was conscience streak, uh, stricken after he had counted the fighting men because he, he wanted to say, okay, I win because I have more numbers. He started playing the numbers game. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. He did not say, well, I need to know, you know, the, the National Statistic Office is asking for a number. No, there was no excuses, no blaming. Before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord came to God, the prophet, David's seer. Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. In short, choose your punishment. Choose your consequence. Choose your penalty. So God went to David and said, Shall there come to you three years of famine in your land or three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you or three days of plague in your land? Now then, think it over and decide how I should answer the one who sent me. David said to God, I am in distress. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercy is great. But But do not let me fall into human hands. When David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I have seen, I, the shepherd, have done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall on me and my family. This is a broken spirit, broken heart. This is the heart that said, Lord, they have nothing to do with my foolishness. Please spare them. Punish me. Let me suffer the consequence. But please spare my people. Compare this against to a prophet, Hezekiah, when the Lord said, because uh, uh, you have been foolish and you have sinned against me, uh, uh, there will be judgment, but not in your lifetime. And he was happy. He was happy because he said, at least not in my lifetime. I will not be around to suffer the consequence. But David said, no, let me suffer the consequence. Spare them. 
They've got nothing to do with that. They're innocent. That is a broken spirit pleading with the Lord. Not to spare him, but to hold him accountable and spare other people. His heart was tender. His spirit was sensitive. He would rather throw himself at the mercy of his God. There's a saying that the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. It is the heart's condition. What is most important in every situation, the most important is our heart. Where is our heart? What is our heart? Matthew 15, 7 to 8. Jesus said, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart are far from me. These people honor me with their lips here in church, but their heart was far from me. They come and raise their hands while worship, and then while raising their hands, they say, what time is it now? They sit there, and the sermon got too long, and they whip out their cell phone, and they check their social media, or scout for what, where they can have lunch afterwards. They got bored. But they're physically present. They're physical. I remember there was a season in my life where I always like to sit in the middle or, or the back because I want to observe people. And I see oh, a lot of this, and I was very upset. And I said, look at that, Lord. She is, she is not paying attention. She's clipping her nails in church during service. I said, Lord, look at that. They're chatting. They're, they're laughing. Look at there, Lord. She's texting somebody. She's not even paying attention. Look at those two. Until one morning, the Lord said, And what are you doing? What are you doing? You are as guilty as them. Why? You notice all these people because you are not focused on me. You know, that was a big slap on my face. I have to do a lot of repenting. I said, I'm sorry, Lord, because I was zealous for you. He said, no, it's none of your business. I know their heart. I learned from that episode. It took me a while to correct my attitude. And so I started sitting in front. So I will not be noticing it and just, just focus on God and just close my eyes and worship. Instead of opening, oh, the overhead, the PowerPoint, wrong spelling. They miss a word again. My goodness, who is that? Oh, it's delayed again. We're seeing second stanza and they're still displaying first stanza. Who's that? Who's that, man? And be bothered by that. The moment I noticed this, I was no longer focused on God. My heart was far from him. It's 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider this is when he was sent to choose the future king, the successor, and, and it was in David's family. So uh, Samuel thought when he saw the brother, bro, this is from Air Force, you know, big body, muscular, handsome, dark. This is it. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You don't have to be impressive, but you can do something with your heart. Other people don't have to know the condition of the heart. But before God, May our hearts be pure. It's okay if it's simple. But our heart is pure. I, say, I, I, I may have shared this story, but uh, there was a time when uh, um, I was a friend with uh, a religious leader. I think we're still friends, I don't know. So I, I, I sent him a book because he loved books. Uh, but for some reason, his denomination has very limited access. 
So I would get great books on faith and prayer and things like that. I would give it to him free. To make it more personalized, I would then uh, write something on the book. I would say, dear pastor, whatever, may you be blessed. And then I received a card from him. The card said, dear brother Willie, thank you for the nice book that you gave me. Uh, uh, I enjoyed reading that. Brother Willie, I would like to correct you. The proper way to address me is not pastor in his name. It should be most reverend than his name. And then he signed, most reverend his name, and then with the cross. I thought you put cross when you die, right? Beside his name. And needless to say, that was the last book he received from me. <laughs> I mean, people get fixated with titles, with position, with, 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 with degree and like that. And... And they set human standards. Uh, if you don't have this degree, you don't reach this, I'm sorry you cannot preach in our church. If Apostle Paul and, and Peter and John were alive today, if the Lord sent them back today, the usher would not even let them come in. Why? They don't have degree. They don't have the right degree. Hello? Hello? It's awfully quiet here. You know what I like about Pastor Jose? He has the degree, but few people know about it. Why? He doesn't insist. In fact, we all call him Brother Jose, and he's pretty okay with that. That would have offended a lot of people who earned their title, who earned their degree. Learn to hold it with the loose hands. Amen. Thank you for that six and a half amen. One coming from the nose. Why is the heart so critical? Matthew 15, 19 to 20 says, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hand does not defile a person. It is what? What we entertain in our hearts. Our heart is the cradle. It is the source. You can say and do all the right thing. His heart is not right. Your heart is not pure. There's nothing good. You can be physically near God by sitting on the front row. But if your heart is not fully engaged, God says, your heart is far from me. You honor me with your lips. But your heart is far away from me. There's a story in Italy many years ago of two monks. Two monks who were sent by the monastery to, to do some errands to the marketing in town. And on their way back to the monastery, they have to cross a river. And uh, uh, as they were crossing the, you know, about to cross the river, there was a lady carrying a lot of things, wanted to cross the river. So they, he, she joined them in, in the boat. But then, you know, the boat was tilting. And so this elderly uh, monk just grabbed hold of her hand to steady her, to save her, to help her, prevent her from falling over. And after that, they got down and they went separate ways. And all the way, the young monk was so scandalous. I can't believe you touch a woman. We are not supposed to touch a woman. And then, how could you do that? I'm so scandalized. You know, you, you will cause people to stumble. And he was just wipe, you know, keep talking about you touch a woman, you're not supposed to touch a woman, you even talk to her, are you alright? How could you do that? I lost all my respect for you, to think you know, you're my senior, you have spent so many years in the, you know, when they reached the gate to the monastery, the, the young past, uh, the young monk got more excited, as he talked about it, he got more excited so the elderly monk quietly looked at him and said you know I have left that woman at the shore. And we went separate way. 
apparently, that woman never left your heart and your mind because you still talk about it. Sometimes, we've, we did not notice what is our preoccupation. What we keep talking about is what we are pre preoccupied about. Are you preoccupied about our problems? You, keep, you know, God will save me, but you know, the doctor said I'm going to die. You know, you know, I need that. You keep talking about the problem. Like what I said the other day. Nobody ever solved a problem by talking about the problem. If you really believe the Lord can bail you up, you talk about God. You talk about His faithfulness. He, you talk about His might. You talk about His power. You talk about His ability to deliver you. Instead of keeping, you know, just, just being preoccupied, fill your mind with that. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Is our heart right? Is our heart right? I'm not asking for perfect heart. God is looking for a broken heart. I like what the African church will do. Uh, I think it's in Kenya or one of the African nations. When they see a Christian and you say, you know, th that's a Christian. You know, normally you ask, uh, how long has he been a Christian? Uh, does he attend ministry? Does he finish any course? You know what the African believers would always ask? Is he a broken Christian? Is he a broken Christian? Is he broken before the Lord? with all his flaws on display. And he did not mind because he was throwing himself at the mercy of God. Is he a broken Christian? How many Christians in the church today can say that I'm a broken Christian? We all want our church to be full of healthy, great, prosperous, growing, strong Christians. But I guess it's about time that we look at the heart and say, is he a broken Christian? Are they, have they been broken before the Lord? Broken people are more conscious of their own spiritual needs than the spiritual needs of other people. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, 3 to 5, why do you look at the speck of sawdust on your brother's eyes and pay no attention to the plank in your own eyes? We, be, we have become self-appointed judge. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your, your, your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from other people's eyes. Have we appointed ourselves as the policeman in church? Look at him, look at him. Fighting with his wife again in church. How scandalous. You know, I noticed that uh, earlier, he's, he's, he, he did not give in the offering, but I, I, I did not. I, I did not see, uh, he dropped the envelope, but I think the envelope was empty. I've heard that a few times from some people. We need to understand brokenness. The broken person has no confidence in their own righteousness or in their own works, but he is cast in total dependence upon the grace of God working in and through him. Compare with the... Uh, Compare Absalom, we talk about Saul and David. Compare Absalom with David too. 2 Samuel 15, 1 to 12. In the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him. He would, not, uh, he would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, he would call out to them, What town are you from? He would ask, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, Look, your claims are valid. 
He was trying to incite them. Yeah, I, I feel you. I understand you. Yeah, it's a valid cause and proper. But there's no representative of the king to hear you. And then he would add, if only I were appointed judge. Elect me in the coming election. Vote for me this November. And I will address your problem. I'll see to it that your grievance is addressed. And after the election, you cannot even approach them. During campaign, they want to be seen shaking, shaking people's hand, hugging you for, or for pictures. But after election, if elected, you cannot even come near them because of the security details around them. Then everyone who has a complaint or case would come to me and I would see that they received justice. He was presenting himself, inserting himself, promoting himself. Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold and kiss the, him. Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. So he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. At the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, let me go to Hebron and fulfill a vow to make, uh, I made to the Lord. When your servant was living in Geshur in Aram, I made this vow. The Lord, if the Lord takes me back to Jerusalem, I will worship the Lord in Hebron. The king said to him, go in peace. So he went to Hebron. Then Abraham sent, uh, Absalom sent secret messengers throughout the tribes of Israel to say, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king in Hebron. He was planning a coup. First, he softened the heart. He made himself look good. He, he stole, he won, he, be, he won the popularity contest. Have you noticed that during an election, that it, it's always easy for the challenger to criticize whoever is in power, and when he sits, they don't fulfill their promise. You know why? Then they realize, oh, oh, it's not that easy. Then they, are, they realize the complexity of things. It is, it is so easy to criticize from the outside in without knowing the situation. And as voters, I pray that we will be smart also. Not be, you know, he shook my hands. He even asked for my name. Wow. What about the heart? Was it for sure? Was it for sure? Was it during campaign period? Was it because of promotional period? Three men died. And they were given a tour of heaven and a tour of hell before they decide where they wanted to go. When they go to heaven, it was bland, it was plain, it's boring. You know, people were sitting around just praising God and say, I do this every day? Just a 30 minutes worship at church, I'm bored already. You want to, me to do that throughout eternity? And the music is not my type. Then when they went to hell, when the elevator opened, Ju, ju, ju. Very interesting. You know, there were free, unlimited drinks, unlimited food, and it's all okay. Oh, my friend is there. Oh, and they give you freebies and, 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 and welcome you and warm you, and they're excited. So after that, they went up again. So Peter said, well, have you made your decision? Yes, hell, of course. Are you sure? Yes, it's more fun down there. Then when they finally made the decision and signed their waiver and went down to hell, when the door opens, it was dark and hot. And who's the free drinks? Who's the fun? Who's the music? All they heard was screaming and crying. And they said, and they said, no, 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 no. We were here earlier. It was not like that. And one of the demons said, oh, that was campaign period. Now your decision has been done. That's a real deal. Many times, we look at circumstances, we believe the promises, but we don't look at the heart. In the Philippines, politicians are very generous. They would volunteer to build a, an ark, 
and make sure that their names is publicly displayed. They would donate an ambulance with their names there, with slogans that will start with their initial. Like Willie W. Chua, wise, wonderful Chinese, WWC. You know, they would always use the, 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 the initials and come up with a slogan. That wise, wonderful, not weird, uh, wonderful Chinese. That, 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 that. But what people don't know is it's never their money. It was public funds, but they were taking the credit. You see, they were doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. They just want to perpetuate the campaign period for the next election. And by the way, the, 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 the van that they donated to your village, if you go to the books, based on the record, it costs four or five times more than the market price. What happened? They jack up and put it there. They give you crumbs and keep the rest for And you are still very thankful. And God sees through that. God sees through that. Abraham, uh, Absalom tried to win people. He was popular with the people. And he made the king look bad. He was handsome and young and energetic. And the king was all shriveled and was always staying in the palace. They seldom see him. He was no longer accessible. And suddenly, this seems to be the best choice, the better choice. It's a no-brainer. That is, if you don't consider the heart, the motive. And so, his heart was revealed. He, he started planning the coup, and he, he said that, uh, you know, he sent uh, people to announce, and 200 men from Jerusalem accompanied him, and they had in they had been invited as guests and went quite innocently, knowing nothing about the matter. While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he also sent for Ahithophel, Gilonite, um, uh, David's counselor, to come for, uh, from Gilo, his hometown. And so the conspiracy gained strength and Absalom's follower, following kept on increasing. He was very political, Vi visible, Pro-people, popular, deliberate, charming, personable, friendly, accessible, but subtle, sly, calculating, but very patient. He surrounded himself with his entourage. There are so many people when they travel, they make sure that they are accompanied by their own cheering squad. Who will sing their praises. I'm not just talking about politicians. There are religious leaders like that in our days. And I pray that we may discern, that we may discern. Do we want to rely on our own merit? Are on God's mercy. Are we quick to accuse or just like David, quick to repent? Usually, when you hear something about other people, we presume guilt. But when it's ourselves, we cry out that, you know, you have to presume me innocent unless proven guilty. We are double standard. We resist criticism or do we rather throw ourselves at the mercy seat of God? Do we judge people or let God judge ourselves? Do we see other people's fault or our own fault? We like to look strong. Is it okay if people see our real condition, see the cracks in our lives, just like the alabaster jar that has to be broken for the perfume to emit, to fill the room, to flow out, God also uses things and people that are broken. How many Christ broken Christians do we have here? 
can you count yourself as a broken Christian? Can we count ourselves as one of the broken Christians? We talk much about revival, but revival really is simply releasing God's spirit flowing through our broken lives. And this is why it's so difficult for us. It's easier for us to volunteer to be sent on mission in a foreign land where nobody knows us rather than Look at our family, our neighborhood, our office, our schools as the mission field. Why? They know us. They know our imperfections. They know our flaws. But if we can start with our own Jerusalem and our Judea and Samaria, then we are ready to go to the ends of the earth. Why? They see that despite our imperfections, despite our flaws, they see the grace of God flowing out of these cracks, these imperfections, this brokenness. Remember, he uses the foolish things of the world to confound confound the wise. This is not something for us to jump up and down, but certainly this is something to trigger us to go on and reflect and assess ourselves. Jesus is coming very, very soon, sooner than we think. In fact, we were talking a few months ago. We observe and, and monitor what's going on around the world. And we agreed that maybe we need to go back, revisit the prophetic calendar and make some adjustment. It seems that the events around the world that has prophetic uh, significance are happening faster and it's gaining more uh, uh, speed. They're happening faster than we anticipated. Jesus might have come earlier, rather sooner rather than later. And the question is, am I ready? Am I ready? And the key is not, oh, tell your members to shape up. Let revival begin in us that we come before the Lord and said, Lord, the Holy Spirit, can you, can you point out what's wrong in my life? I'm willing to submit myself to your correction and your cleansing, and I throw myself at your mercy. Judge me, Lord, and correct me. No longer will I hide my flaws, but by revealing my flaws, I also allow your glory to be revealed. May Jesus come back and find us faithful. May Jesus come back and find his bride perfect. Let's all stand.